Hello, hello, here we go, it's the Copyright Podcast. Hello everyone and welcome back to the Copyright Podcast, I'm Mick Moran as usual and I'm joined by Dave's LFC Chats. Uh, how are you doing how are we- Dave? I'm absolutely brilliant, my friend. I can't wait for this. It's just been some fantastic uh, two games we just have at Liverpool. And I'm sure we're going to get into the Thiago and Jota and all that. But uh, dreamland. Right. In dreamland. Dreamland. <laughs> yeah, Dave's got his own um, YouTube channel as well. So you, go, you should go and check that out. He's on a hostel interview with James Pace the other day, which was really good. So you go, go and check that out. We're also joined by Matt Ramirez. Hey. The Weed of Bolton. I do love <laughs> Defender of Jordan Henderson, I'm good. <laughs> it's been a while. How's it, how's it feel to be back? It's been a long um, time. Like a, a long awaited return. The prodigal son <laughs> comes back. <laughs> Love all that. Anyway, we'll, we'll jump straight in. Um, yeah, Sunday, Liverpool 2, Chelsea 0, Stamford Bridge. Two goals for Sadio Mane, 45 minutes under Thiago Alcantara's belt. And an all round statement for. Of, of intent from Liverpool, I thought. Um, I just wanted to get your feelings on how you felt going into the game. Obviously, Fabinho starting at centre back, no Gomez, no Matip. Obviously, they, I think they've suffered injuries in the same on the same day. Unfortunately, for me, I was a bit worried about Fabinho. I was worried about Werner maybe targeting him in terms of pace wise, because we all know Fabinho is not the quickest and Werner's rapid. What were your thoughts when you seen the when you seen the team news and you were just your general thoughts going into the game? We'll start with you, Matt. Uh, actually, before the game, I, I made a prediction to my dad. Um, and I told him that by the end of the season, Fabinho is going to be the centre-back partner for Van Dijk. At the same time, though, I was a bit concerned because he's not the, the quickest. And Werner is rapid. But he had him in his pocket. Like, he did have him in his pocket. Um, I've, uh, well, he's defensively solid enough to, to play centre-back. I'm not sure if he will when... Like Gomez and Matip are fit, but I, I was happy enough with them. I thought he was really impressive, and for me, he was the man of the match. Yeah, Dave, would you would you echo that sentiment for for being here? I thought he was great myself. I, I gave him man of the match, like Matt. Um, I said it with, as I said with James Pierce yesterday. He gave him man of the match as well. Um, he was brilliant. He actually outshone Van Dijk, and that is not easy to do. I mean, you know, he's not a nat- natural centre half. I think he was right back for Monaco, so he. He knows the defence game. But um, I'll tell you what he does do. He reads the game very well. Um, and being a midfielder, you know, he, he, you'll always notice that he reads the game. And reading the game as in front of the, the back four as a DM, as a centre half, it helps, doesn't it? You're watching the game in front of you. And I thought he was absolutely brilliant. I, I was worried before the game, as you just said, with Gomez and Matt about both injury prone, unfortunately, going forward. But there was always that talk of if Thiago came in and played in the middle, Fabinho was always that option he could play centre half he, he did it before against Bayern Munich away which was unbelievable he did an unreal game that time he did it before I think he had a clean sheet in that game so I wasn't worried that way but I was worried about pace because he's not the paciest the centre halves yeah. and with Werner's pace I was a little worried but man of the match for me all day long Yeah I think we're a bit spoiled aren't we because we've got Gomez who's equally as rapid as Van Dijk I think and we've got Matip who's not the slowest either but like you said Dave those Go go gadget legs he's got, and the way he reads the game, and the way he can <laughs> pick out those passes, it's it, it's a it's a privilege to have him in there because he can pick out those little diagonal balls that maybe Gomez or Matip can't do as well as him because he's like a seasoned CDM and like you said, play right back, so he's got that technical ability in there. But yeah, we'll just crack on. Well, um, the first half I thought was a bit was a bit cagey, wasn't it? We've seen a, a few glimpses of what what Kepa can and can't do when um, he came out to try to smother Salad and he nearly scored straight away pretty much uh, I think it was for, uh, for me you know, it went out for a corner in the end but that just was a sign of things to come wasn't it I think Chelsea fans can spend as much money as they want really up the top of the pitch but when you've got like someone like that in goal you're always susceptible to, to conceding goals aren't you he is horrible uh... <laughs> He's shocking. Um, I'd take Carius over him. Carius' brother. <laughs> he is, and to think he's the world record goalkeeper in terms of transfer fee is mad. Like he's horrible. <laughs> 
what did you what do you think about Kepa Dave? Do you, do you agree? He's, he is he is I think they spent seventy one million, which is more than we pay for Allison, which is absolutely mental when you think about it. I don't like slagging I, I've been to phone obviously, but I don't really like slagging young players that are young, uh, you know, trying to get out of the game. This guy when we signed Allison he was the world uh, it was the world record goalkeeping prize for a goalkeeper. Within a week or two, I think it was 10 days or something, Chelsea came along and signed Kepa and I was going, I actually didn't know a huge amount of belt. I was going, Pay, you, you've actually paid more than we did for Alisson. Um, he's made too many mistakes and similar to Carrius. I mean, you can't make mistakes as a goalkeeper because he usually ends up as a goal or a seven off or something that will, will change the game, you know. And um, defensively, it just disturbs the whole team at the back, doesn't it? If, you're go- if you know your goalkeeper behind you, we've seen it with Carrius. We've even seen it with Mignolet at times, to mm-hmm. be fair. I don't want to just keep slagging Carrius, but I mean, Mignolet at times was poor. I mean, if you've got a bad goalkeeper behind you, no matter how good you are in front, even if you're VVD in front, and you know you've a kept by someone like that behind you, you're never right. I mean, how can you be like confident going into a game? Are we going to keep clean sheet or going to have to bail him out? You know that type of thing. But uh, I actually pity the young lad. To be fair, not the wages he's on, but just just the way just the way people are turning on him. But I think Chelsea are going to sign a new keeper soon, anyway. So, yeah, I do yeah. about him because uh, I'm a Bilbao fan as well. Um, and obviously, they signed him from Bilbao. Um, and I, he was a good keeper, but he's not seventy-one million pounds worth of goalkeeper. Uh, Thing, the thing with Bilbao is that you either pay the release clause or you go away. They just don't negotiate. And Chelsea just fell into that trap of, all right, we'll pay it. And now they're seriously regretting it. Yeah, and I think when you look at our first, well, the, 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 the main bit of action towards the first half, when obviously Christensen rugby tackles Sadio Mane, uh, I think, <laughs> I think Allison, if it was Allison in goal for on that type of counter-attack. I think Alisson, positionally-wise, comes out earlier and clears that. I think that, like he's just t- touched on Kepa there, I think maybe he's not quite, I think he's I think he's a bit overconfident in his own ability, a bit like certain Everton T-Rex arms, Jordan Pickford. He's a bit overconfident and I think that goes against him sometimes and it's those type of, uh, <laughs> no. Yeah, it's just like those type of things where, like Dave said, you're always worried that something's going to happen at the detriment of your, of your team. And yeah, just on the stroke of half time, that happens. And then I think you think in second half. You, you, I was thinking, well, we're not going to pro- we're not going to bring Thiago on. And then you see um, you see him getting stripped, ready to come on for Jordan Henderson. What what was your thoughts, Matt? I was absolutely ecstatic. Well, firstly, the ball by Jordan Henderson is yeah. Well, yeah, we'll talk. Yeah, let's yeah. talk about that. The run by the run by Mane alone, but to pick him out like that, he never gets the credit he deserves any, anyway. But that that ball, like you said, was was special. I had a bunch of people messaging me going, "Oh, Mane wasn't going to get there. He was going to get there. He was right there." Um, and Kepa should have either stayed at home and not come out, or come out a lot sooner. He hesitated, and that's 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 why Christensen just takes him completely out. But um, Mane was going to get there, and he was either going to go round Kepa or he was going to get fouled. So Christensen kind of had to do it. Uh, but when saw Thiago warming up, obviously weren't aware straight away from the, end, uh, the Henderson injury. But I thought it was very much a Klopp smelling blood in the water sort of thing. The, he's, we're going to see that he's going to be our most creative player, Thiago, in terms of his natural ability on the ball. And the fact that Chelsea were... Sitting back anyway with 11 men, you knew they were going to sit back with 10. Um, and seeing him get stripped off, I was just like, ooh, here we go. And then yeah, every time yeah. he pushed the ball, I was just losing my mind. Losing my, the simplest little pass. I was like, oh, look at him. Woo. <laughs> yeah, and I think Klopp came out after the game saying like it was literally the perfect scenario to bring Thiago in. Like, we'll see, they're down to 10 men. Like you said, Matt, they're going to be sitting back to bring on someone like that who's going to come on and dictate tempo and play those either needle passes that break lines of opposition. It, it couldn't have went any better. And like you said, the way he, just the way he passes the ball, like even six yards, it's just so crisp. And like even in the pub I was in watching it, there was round of applauses for three yard passes. Which when's, when's that? When does that ever happen? It was just. What, what were your thoughts, Dave, when you saw? Was you surprised that he was coming on that early? Um, I, I actually was thinking he might come on at half time because I mean I think they brought him 
to use him. I don't think he would have brought him and had him there on the bench. You know, he's only after signing. I think he'd only one or two training sessions, one proper training session. Yeah. I mean, you're not going to have him there as a sub unless you, in the back of your mind you're saying, we, we might need him or might, might have to use him. I think we had him there just in case there was going to be trouble because I'd say it was a tough game. I mean, Chelsea is a tough place to go. I know there's no fans there, but it's still Stamford Bridge. Not everybody will win there. And they're a good young side, Chelsea, you know. And uh, I think he had him there as a backup, but I didn't think he'd obviously nil nil at half time, 10 men, perfect scenario to come on. Tap the ball, it's orgasmic. It was actually porn. It was actually porn. It was, it was, it was, you know, it was pure porn, clickbait, beautiful. Little flicks, you ever see little flicks, little turns? I know he gave away a peno, but it didn't matter in the end. But it's just, it's just, it's just a glimpse of what we have to look forward to going forward. I mean, it, he's going to give us so much so much in the midfield. It's just, it's orgasmic. I mean, you could go away to the toilets for five minutes after watching that. It was unreal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and like, the, I know like, it's maybe a bit over the top to look at the stats after the game, but he's, he's, he's had 75 successful passes, more than any Chelsea player in the game. I think he had like 89 touches, more than any Chelsea player during the whole game and the most passes in a 45 minute period since records passing records began in 2003. I mean, you can read into that as much as you want. Like, most of them were five, six-yard passes, but like we said, they've described it perfectly. They're orgasmic, just crisp, just the right amount of weight on them all. And I mean, he made a couple where he was just breaking lines. And like you said, like, even when we come up against, when, if he, when he starts starting games, the teams that come to downfield field and want to sit back and play, 10 men behind the ball and counter-attack, he is going to be absolutely crucial in those games to, to get us over the line. Because of the, sometimes maybe our midfield's a bit too predictable where we, the, the usual fear we have in there, maybe don't play those passes out to maybe not wanting to lose the ball, but he'll come on and he'll he'll make things happen. And it's, it's exciting times, isn't it? See, our midfield three from last year, I think what the most users what Genie, Hendo and Fab and Fabi. So it's very dynamic, but it's, you wouldn't call it creative. Um, and what that, at least in my head, allows is for teams to come to Anfield, sit back, and not really worry about marking our midfielders because they're not going to produce a moment of quality just to change the game. Now, you put Thiago into that mix, and all of a sudden, if you're coming to Anfield and sit back, you've got to mark him. You can't leave him on his own. And that's one less player marking... Mane, Firmino, Salah, that's more space in behind, that's more danger for Liverpool so even the fact of him being on the pitch without the ball is going to take another opposition player out of the game let alone when he's on the ball and now you know it's the fact he's got so many touches, so many passes our players are looking to give him the ball, you didn't see that last season, we weren't looking to give our midfielders the ball, we are looking to give it to Bobby, Mane, Salah um, but this just gives us just another, another dimension altogether and it's it is exciting that I think it didn't come off for him but he got the ball on the edge of the Chelsea area did a little shuffle past Jorginho and clipped it to the back post and it was just he's done it so quickly so effortlessly the more he gets involved with this team the more training sessions he has he's going to be just unreal yeah and I think when I was watching him I was thinking like you said there Matt like it's it's the it's the fact it's the quickness and where he does things like he picks it up he'll take one touch pass it and like the answer to this is that is like a, when what we used to have, like Emre Chan in there, maybe, for example, who'd pick it up, take five, six, seven passes, and then pass it off. And I was like, what a, com- what, what a compare and contrast that is. Like, yeah. absolute world-class player in there who's going to make things happen. And to be fair, it, it gives us another dimension in terms of maybe playing a different system as well. Because like you just said there, Matt, having usually Hendo and um, Gini on the sides of a midfield three, there's their function is literally to be systematic in that three and to sit back and to cover for their bombing on fullbacks. But you put Thiago in the mix there, like you said, it's an absolute nightmare for opposition midfield because he's gonna pick up he's gonna pick it up in front of the back four. He might see him on the left, might see him on the right, he might see him in the ten. And it's that fluidity that under Klopp was so used to and adding him into that mix, it's gonna be it, it's exciting times, isn't it, Dave? The, the, the analogy I would use is Liverpool's midfield three is always static. Um, it reminds me of a, a can of Red Bull. It's full of energy. It's nice to drink. It's refreshing. But Thiago is the glass of champagne, baby. And did you ever drink Red Bull and champagne and blow the bloody head off you? That's what you want in your midfield. That's what you want. 
And I can tell you now, the front three, including Jota, the front four now, are licking their bloody lips. They're going to have champagne and Red Bull all weekend, baby. <laughs> well, we've just got the podcast title, Red Bull and Champagne. That, well, that's us. So I'll see you next time. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm just anyway, no, the analogy. The analogy is the champagne. Obviously, is Thiago. I mean, you know, champagne yeah. football. He, he he's that level. I mean, he's a world class talent, really, isn't he? I mean, like it's as I said, I did a pod with James Pierce yesterday, and even he he was saying it. Like, and I'm saying I'm following Liverpool since the early '80s. It's it's very rare we sign a ready-made international superstar. We usually sign stars. Even Torres wasn't a super superstar when we signed him from Atletico and then turned him into superstars. Even Suarez wasn't when we signed him from Ajax. He became a superstar at Liverpool. It's very rare we do it. Um, we, we, and and at, at that age, 29, the only other fellow I know that was older, older, even older, I think, I think he was 32, was, was um, Gary McAllister from Leeds at the time. And he did an unbelievable time for us in the early noughties, if you remember, we won the, the, the treble, the League Cup, the FA Cup and the Europa. Well, we, at the time, I think you wait for Cup. But it's experience as well. I don't know whether you noticed him. He was pointing. He was pointing, telling people what to do. He's only on the pitch 45 minutes. Yeah, it's brilliant. He, he, was, he, he was real. He's leaving. Yeah, when, and when you think, like, I've not in there, it's going to be so... It's, it's exciting times, isn't it? But anyway, we'll crack on. Within five minutes of Thiago coming on, Mane gets his first and a half first. A nice little swift interchange on the edge of the box with Salah and Firmino. Boss little ball in by Bobby and Mane gets ahead of Reese James and puts his one nil up. Uh, did, was you expecting a load more goals after that quick start in the second half, Matt? Um, no, I wasn't expecting loads of goals because I thought Chelsea would do what they did, which is sit back and then try stay in the game and then maybe in the last ten minutes go for it. Because there wasn't really they were dangerous in the first half and even when Werner got away, they didn't really have any clear cut chances. So I didn't think Lampard would risk it because. I think everyone in the league knows if you risk against Liverpool, you're going to concede. Um, I didn't expect Kepa to do what he did for the second goal. Um, but the first goal was just, it was typical Liverpool, wasn't it? It was just a little quick interchange on the edge of the area. And then Mane, who isn't the most physical guy in the world, but somehow scores a ton of headers. It's just... Yeah, it, it was quite reminiscent of his... Um... Of his, of his Villa one last year again, at, at Villa Park, wasn't it? Where he's just got in front of the defender and clipped it into, into, the, into the far corner. And like you said, it was only a matter of time, so we got another one. I think it was four minutes after. Like you said, and we've just touched on there, Kepa makes a... I think it was originally Mane makes a bad pass, tries to play Firmino through. And he's obviously pissed off at himself, runs full pelt, closes Kepa down, and he literally tries to... It, it was carious, like, the way he's tried to play it out yeah, to the yeah. centre-back. Man, he's got his foot in there, and then puts us two 0 up. And what did you what did you think from there, Dave? Did you think we'd got a couple of more, or was you, was you just happy with the, the two 0 from then on? Um, two 0 is always a dangerous uh, scoreline, even against ten men. Uh, we were away from home. Um, Chelsea actually played a little better when they went two 0 down, maybe because they had nothing else to play for, I suppose. But it was only going to be probably a mistake that was going to let them in. To be fair, I mean, Allison hadn't got a huge amount to do, you know. Um, Thiago was on, he was controlling the midfield, he was pulling the strings. But um, I always thought if we really needed to up our game and go, in, go into a top gear, we probably could have. You know, we sort of eased off at 2-0, you know, passing around. It was, it was too easy at times. Um, you know, and you know yourself, 2-0 is, if, if you score a goal against you, 2-0 is never a safe sort of scoreline. But uh, I, never, I was never really worried. I, I was happy in the position we were in. And I, I wasn't worried at all because Chelsea weren't really showing much going forward at that stage, you know? Yeah, and then obviously like we touched on, well, like you just touched on there, they had the penalty. That thing that was on 75 minutes. Um, Werner, nice little run inside, inside channel. And then he came inside. And for, for me, when I watched it in real time, I thought that's a bit of a soft one. And even when I saw the replay, it's a bit of a coming together. And I suppose technically it was probably a penalty. For me, I thought it was a bit soft. Um, and then, Oh, thankfully, uh, Alisson said, I think that's his first pen save for us, Alisson, I think, which was like a, when you think they've got Kepa down their end and we've got Alisson in goal, who, could, like, we, you know, he's not the greatest of pens because obviously we had the Community Shield recently that he didn't manage to save one, but then he goes to Stamford Bridge and keeps his, 
it makes it a, a lot easier for us. If we can see that goal with, with what, 15 minutes to go, they've got the tails up. They, they could have easily grabbed another, couldn't they, Matt? Yeah, I mean, football is unpredictable. Like, you could have backs against the wall losing 2 0. Istanbul 2005, getting completely just trounced, losing 3 0. Milan all over, all over Liverpool, and then one quick goal, and then all of a sudden you get two in the space of five minutes, and the game's completely turned around. Um, they get a goal, they get a bit of confidence, we go back, and then it's anyone's game. Uh, but it was, apart from the fact there was a good save by Allison, some stupid penalty by Jorginho, and I know that he does that all the time, that's his sort of signature thing. If you're losing 2 0, just smash it. What are you doing? Yeah, I think I looked at his record. I think he's, I think that's his first one he's missed in nine. I think, yeah. like he said, he's, he's usually spot on with them. And I, I myself, I hate that fucking stupid run up where he does a little hop, skip, and a jump, like he's doing a fucking long jump or something. Because if I right knob. So that's the thing. When it goes in, it looks good. But when it's something like that, it's like when you try to chip down the middle. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it doesn't come off. It look, you look like a dickhead. Whereas if it goes in, you're all right. But I'm thankfully Alison saved it. Anyway, I just want, I just want to finish on. Um, I want, I want to talk about Sadio Mane for the end. The end of this pod. Um, I know Fabinho was probably the overwhelming man of the match for slotting into centre back and doing so well. But Mane grabbed two goals. I think he's the only, only the third Liverpool player to score a brace at Stamford Bridge. Steve McManaman in '95, Philip Coutinho in 2015, and um, with those two goals, it puts him in the top 20 all-time Liverpool goal scorers. He's now on 83. He went ahead of Luis Suarez and Fernando Torres. Is there any? left-sided winger better than him in the world at the moment I'll go with you I'll go with you Dave the answer is no <laughs> no no I mean a man in the mirror I call him you know what I mean he's, he's unbelievable he's just uh, he's just got better and better and better I remember when we signed him from Southampton there was, there was a bit of a what are we signing this guy for it was 30 odd million people saying it was too much money he's pacey but he doesn't score goals he's put the goals to his finishing touches. He always had the raw talent. He had the power. He's plenty of power. Pace. Plenty of pace. But as a, a lot of players, he wasn't quite the finisher. Now his finishing is world class. That's the, what's brought him to a new level. The finishing. And uh, the good thing about Liverpool is we don't need our front three to be all on fire. We only need one of them to be on. It was Man- Salah last week. It was Mane this weekend. Bobby's been off it for a while. But if the front three click, <laughs> you must forget about it. I mean, we only need one of them. But Mane, for me, it was a toss-up between Mane and Fabinho for man of the match, to be honest. It could have went either way. I just thought of Fabinho for the fact that going in the centre-half, away from home, clean sheet, playing well. I mean, Mane, you're sort of expecting his goal goals, really, aren't you? But uh, there wasn't much between him and Fabinho to get man of the match. But Mane, for me, going forward, we we got to hold on to him as long as we can because he, he's an absolute superstar. Yeah. Matt, what are your thoughts on uh, Sadio Mane? Uh, same as Dave, uh, he's, he's been real. He's uh, the biggest difference I think between Salah and Mane is that you know what Salah's going to do. You can't stop him anyway, but you know what he's going to do. He's going to look to cut in and shoot. Not even Sadio Mane knows what Sadio Mane is going to do. He's just he's dynamic. He's he's strong. I haven't seen a centre like a defender knock him off the ball yet, fairly without fouling him. Uh, his dribbling's on point. His finishing, like Dave said, is. It, it's taken his game to another level. His heading as well. He's just, when he's on it, he's unplayable. And even when he's not on it, he's still bagging goals. So, I, the, the debate's always if we had to lose one of the front three, who would we lose? Who should we lose? And it, it definitely shouldn't be Manny. Um, that man needs to stay for as long as we can keep him. Yeah, and he's, he, I think he's 28 now. So, he, he's, he's literally in his prime. And I think the sign of Thiago, it makes us, apart from making us shitloads better, it makes these players who we've got there, who are superstars already, think, well, why would we want to leave to another club when we've just we're signing one of the best midfielders in the world who's going to make us score an absolute fucking bucket load? And it, it, is, it is a good sign, isn't it? When these front three, they're, they're now in the prime, they're playing for, obviously we're all, gonna, we're all biased, we're all going to say Liverpool the best team in the, in the world, but I think we are. I think we'll, if we keep everyone fifth this year, I think we'll, I don't want to be a, one of those that that that's with that, <laughs> that meme on Twitter that fella going. I think we're going to do the treble, but I think we're going to do the treble. <laughs> this is going to this is going to get clipped, and I'm going to get fucking ripped to shreds. I don't give a fuck. The quadruple baby. <laughs> <laughs> 
Dave, I wish we were all as optimistic as you, honestly. <laughs> Love it. Anyway, fellas, uh, we'll we'll leave it there for now. Uh, thanks to Dave's LS chat. Like I said, go and check it out. His YouTube channel, Boss Interview with James Pierce, on there yesterday, which was very insightful. Go and check that out. Go and check out Matt Ramirez's um, <laughs> with page if you want, if you fancy it. Not his Facebook, just just yeah, just that <laughs> one. I want to need the followers, so. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we'll uh, we'll. We'll see you next week. Give us a little subscribe. Give us a like. Shoot us a comment. Um, give us your best um, emoji for how shit Kepper is. <laughs> give us whatever you give us whatever you want, and we'll uh, we'll see you next time.